Hey everyone, welcome back. Tonight we're going to talk about finding agents and we're also going to talk about heat and cold stability. If you want to follow along, this is chapter 7 of our Principles and Practices in Winemaking uh, textbook. So the first part of it can be rather um, dense and hard to read, but they do open up into sections about um, you know, earths and polysaccharides, and all the stuff that we're going to talk about as presented in the slideshow. So if you want another resource, definitely check out the textbook. Okay, so we're going to start off with finding agents. So what are finding agents? It's an addition of a reactive substance um, to deliberately remove or reduce the concentration of one or more undesirable constituents. And there's two parts to this. It could be a sensory undesirable constituent or it could be a stability. So it could either like smell bad or taste bad or it could be too um, bitter, too astringent, or it could... Um, could be hazy, it's not a clear product, could be like a cosmetic thing. Um, so these are both situations when finding agents are used. So definitely keep that in mind. So the dosage, the amount of finding agent that you use is determined by bench trials. There isn't just like a solid number for some of these things that's just used across the board. You definitely want to use the smallest amount possible to get to your desired goal uh, for finding. So um, many agents can be used for the same goal, but if you're not satisfied with the results, you can try another finding agent. And then I have some articles here for you guys to read if you'd like to see those. So lots of resources on this lecture. So why would we find? Well, to improve clarity and stability of a wine, but also to remove possible faults. So this could, like I said, this could be softening the wine, reducing any bitterness or astringency. Um, metal ions can produce a haze, so that's another fault. Any off characters or off character forming potential could help prevent that and treat it. And also stability. So we talk about stability. This is, if for someone, they're mostly cosmetic things, but Say I'm a large company and I'm shipping wine across the United States and this wine is exposed to heat. That heat can form a haze in the wine and it looks like it's an unclean product. You know, consumers think it's gone bad when not when the reality is it's a cosmetic defect. Um, but it's very important for companies because they want to keep a good reputation and have the best foot forward. So might be cosmetic, but it's important, and, we, and it can be prevented with finding agents. So here's just a nice little chart given to us by um, Washington State University Extension, WSU, and it kind of lines out the problem and what that problem is, a description, and then the finding agent that's used to treat that problem. So hydrogen sulfide, H2S, is, we talked about this in class, it's a kind of a st stinky, rotten egg smell. It can smell like onions or kind of um, like stagnant water sometimes. Thiols also are included in this. The finding agent to treat this is copper sulfate. So if you made it to our winemaking lab, we actually did treat one of our students' wines with copper sulfate, and the results were pretty immediate, so it's very satisfying. Um, polysaccharides, if you have a polysaccharide instability in your wine, it creates a haze, and we treat that with enzymes and other things. Uh, you can also have a different type of haze caused by proteins, and that's mostly treated with bentonite. And this is also a stability situation, too. I was talking about the example of wine being exposed to heat. That heat can precipitate those proteins. It's most noticeable in white wines. So what we'll do is... To treat for heat stability, we'll do trials with bentonite, put that wine in a hot box to simulate being exposed to heat, and then determine how much bentonite it took for it to not form a haze, even when exposed to heat. So that's kind of a preview of that. Excess tannins can make a wine really astringent, and excess catechins can make a wine really bitter. Those can also be treated with protein finding agents and PVPP, we talked a little bit about PVPP earlier. We're gonna talk about that again. And then if you have browning or just stink in your wines, uh, any off colors and aromas, you can use carbon. As we talked about before, carbon is very severe and can remove some of the positive things as well. That's why it's important that you add the smallest amount possible to achieve your results because you can start pulling out positive things from the wine as well. So for trials, 
finding trials. It's really important that you pay attention to preparation methods, temperature, mixing, and timing. Um, the effectiveness of your agents is going to be completely reliant on you following these directions and preparing it the right way. Um, so it can be reduced by 50% with improper preparation, so definitely follow the guidelines. Um, finding agents are also not sterile, so make sure you store them properly because it could be a source of microbes. Very important. There are things that can spoil and you know potentially not be good, so be careful. So we're going to have two parts to tonight's discussion. The first part is different classes of finding agents. So we're going to talk about the proteins, natural earths and clays, synthetic polymers, activated carbons, and other agents. We're not going to talk about potassium ferrocyanide. So you don't have to worry about that. Do, do, do. And then part two will be wine stability before bottling. So we're going to talk about cold stabilization, uh, what wine diamonds are, and heat stability. So that's kind of the overview of what's going on. So this whole section here is all lined in the textbook. I got that directly from the textbook. Um, so if you would like an overview, definitely go to chapter 7. Okay, so let's start with proteins. Proteins are fantastic. Um, we do use them in wine, and it's very common. Some people, some wineries don't. Some wineries' philosophy is to not use finding agents at all. Honestly, it should be used sparingly. It should not be used in recipe winemaking. Like I said, you should only use it if you absolutely need it. Um, and these are components that are going to be filtered out, most likely, and you will not be drinking these things. Or at least that's how it should be done. So proteins include things like gelatin, uh, casein, which is milk, isinglass, which is fish bladder, and albumin, which is just eggs, egg whites. So Commonly, yes, winemakers just go to the store and buy these things and dump it in a tank. Um, why do we use this? It's to soften and reduce the astringency of wine. So if you have a wine that's just over extracted, just way too tannic and way too harsh, these things can help. It'll bind to those tannins and it will help soften the wine. So again, you don't want to over treat it because then you remove all the tannins and you want some tannins, right? So you want to do trials and make sure you're adding the proper amount. So all of these proteins carry positive charges all around their surface. So they bind with negative charges on phenolics. Then they precipitate out of the wine. They become solid chunks. So that way when it goes through a filter, they get caught and it's not in the final product that you're drinking. So this brings up a really good point though. Should wineries be obligated to display on their label all the ingredients used during the winemaking process. So all the finding agents um, and everything. Because you could argue that trace amounts do go through. So very interesting food for thought. So uh, we have lots of different things that we can use for finding. Like you see lots of options, gelatin, milk, fish bladder, eggs, you know, lots of different options. Why are there so many different options and why is that important? Well, it's because different finding agents have different levels of absorption. So, or adsorption. So, um, depending on how uh, intense the problem is, you can choose a finding agent that is a soft or a very intensely binds to these things. So, here we have a chart. This is the adsorption of phenolic fractal fractions by various finding agents. So, here on the y axis, we have the concentration of phenolics. So this is contributing to astringency um, in wine. So just think it's just over, over tannic, over, um, it's really like harsh on the finish, very like chalky. Do you want to remove that? So say this is the concentration. So we're starting at a very high concentration, right? And then here on the X axis, we have the addition rate. And then these different lines that you see are the different types of finding agents that are used. So as you can see, this is kind of like a reverse exponential um, graph here. And what we see is all the different types of agents. And so even if you add just 60 milligrams per liter, you see a very severe depletion of these harsh uh, phenolics, right? Go from up to 400 down to, you know, around 
160 for some of these for 240 for another so there's a severe decline but you'll see with the more finding agents you add the less of a depletion that you see so you'll never get to zero but depending for depending on that um, finding agent it has more a higher absorption rate than others so and you'll find that you have depleting returns so once you add more than say 120 milligrams per liter of any of these things, um, your results are, are very small, very small difference. This is why the bench trials are important. So as we see from this graph, the um, we're going to see which is the least severe and which one is the most severe. So the least severe finding agent is going to be the egg. So you can see here it's the diamond. So this is the egg. So it kind of branches off around the most it can absorb is between 160 and 240. So probably about maybe two, 200 right here. The most severe finding agent is PVPP. It's the square right here. So as you can see, once you add up to, you know, maybe say this is 150 maybe parts per million or milligrams per liter, you see a huge depletion in the amount of phenolic fractions. So whether you choose a finding agent based off of the severity of the situation or just based on your own personal wants. Um, you might just be the person who's just a fan of eggs because they're gentler and you know, you're not really worried about maybe allergies or something. I don't know. Um, that could be an option. Then we have in between those two, we have skim milk, which is the upside down triangle and then casein um, and the right side up triangle. So very exciting. So yeah, powder versus regular milk. Very cool. So hopefully that makes sense. So moving on to from proteins to earths. Earths um, are to be like bentonite or kaolin. Bentonite is very, very common. It's used at the beginning before fermentation to help settle out and um, keep the juice from becoming cloudy. So it's a cleaner product down the line. But it's also used before bottling and before what we call heat, stabi heat stability of wine. So it's actually a twofer. It's used before fermentation and after fermentation. This is very common for white wines. This is not a common treatment for reds. So this will help remove proteins from the wine and help clarify the juice. So it become, it's, of course, it's very noticeable with whites is how hazy it can be. So this is covered in negative charges from all the metal ions that are in this earth-like material. And it binds with the positive charges from amino acids of the proteins. So it's really important that this is prepared appropriately. You can't just, would not recommend just tossing in dry bentonite into your wine. You're going to lose a lot of wine and it's not going to be very effective. The clay actually needs to be swollen for it to be most effective. So you use super hot water and mix it in as you're pouring it in very slowly and very carefully. And then once a perfect slurry with no chunks in it, then you add it to your juice or your wine. So we do have a little write up on that. So that's how that is used. Then we have synthetic polymers. So this is like PVPP, um, nylon. These are both insoluble white powders, so you won't be consuming these things. These, sh these are things that are intended to be filtered out once they react with the bitterness in the wine. So these specifically reduce bitterness and remove browning compounds. So how they do this, a little bit of chemistry, they have available carbonyl oxygen atoms at the surface that, re that act as adsorption sites for the bitter and browning compounds. So it's racked and filtered from the wine. Uh, PVPP is definitely preferred, has a much more efficient adsorption rate, just as we saw in that chart. It's very reactive, so it'll definitely get the job done. It's a mess, though, because it's a very fine powder. <laughs> it's a mess. Then we have polysaccharides. So uh, as we see here, this looks a lot like what bentonite does to juice, right? So we start with something really hazy, and then we get a clear product. Well, there's two types of instabilities in juice and wine. There's a protein instability and a polysaccharide instability. Um, so this is the other situation where it gets this haze, but uh, this is something else you can use to help settle finely suspended matter. In your juice or wine. So a product that's very commonly used is called sparkaloid. 
It's a clarifying agent, um, and it can be composed of agar or gum arabic, which is also known as acacia. So there you go. Activated carbons. So activated carbon is like we were talking about before in our pre-treatments lecture. It helps remove color and wine and also removes odors. But carbon is a very non-selective in broad fining agent. So it just binds and reacts with everything. And it's generally um, not used unless it's an extreme situation because it can remove both positive aromas and, and negatives. But it's um, just very severe. So it comes in this very fine black powder, makes a mess everywhere if you spill it. Very careful. What we have here in this picture is this was a white wine that was being pressed at a facility I previously worked at. And we pressed it so hard because we wanted to get the most juice from the tank that from the grapes that we could. But as you press harder for a white wine, you start to get this orange colored juice here. So this is pre-fermentation. This is juice. So we pressed those white grapes so hard that we started extracting color from the skins. So we put that in a separate drum on the side and we treated that with activated carbon to remove the color and then officially blended that back into the white wine or white juice tank um, as it as it was fermenting. And we were able to get an extra, you know, 45 gallons out of this to add to our lot. So by treating it on the side and then racking it off of that carbon and blending it back in, we were able to get more bang for our buck. So that was a situation that that was okay because we we're treating a very small lot. We we're very careful. We used a very small amount and then we've uh, racked it off immediately and it reacts pretty quickly. Um, so definitely, again, it's important to do a bench trial so you know exactly what to expect. But you only want it on the carbon for one day two days, you know, after a week, it's going to be pure water. So just be careful. Okay. Another really common finding agent is copper sulfate. So this is what we used in class. Um, it helps to remove hydrogen sulfide and thiols. We talked about those horrible smells that that produces. What ultimately produces these compounds in wines are stressed fermentations or a lack of nutrients. So during a fermentation, if there's a lack of nutrients, the yeast will actually go cannibalistic and start to consume each other. And at this point, they're consuming amino acids and things. And some of these amino acids have sulfur end groups. So um, once that sulfur end group gets cleaved from the amino acid, it combines with hydrogen to produce hydrogen sulfide. And that's what gives that horrible, eggy, um, sweaty armpit, burnt rubber smell. So it could be lots of things. Luckily, it's very treatable. Copper sulfate reacts immediately. You have to be careful if you add too much. You can actually mute the aroma in the wine altogether. This is why bench trials are very important. It's also really important to know that your, the level of addition and residual should be less than half a part per million. So 0 0.5 ppm. This is the legal dose. It's just for the safety of the public. We don't want anyone consuming it. Um, it's also important that you don't taste or consume the wine within 48 hours of adding copper sulfate because it needs to react and precipitate out of solution or you could be consuming higher levels than you should be. So remember that. Okay, typical dosage rates for various finding agents. We have here, I really like this chart. So if you're someone that's going to be using finding agents and you want to pursue this and really understand it and use it for your wine, um, we have a list of the types of finding agents and then the typical dosage rates depending on what country you're in. So gelatin, you know, 30 to 300. Um, Isinglass, egg albumin, PVPP, and bentonite. And these are in milligrams per liter. So just for your information. Okay, we also have another chart here. So this chart was taken from the UC Davis's Wine Stability Reader, which was a textbook that was given to you as a Davis. We also have a much nicer chart here, um, which will actually lay out the type of wine. And it'll also give you the quantity for a five-gallon batch. So those of you that have five-gallon carboys at home, 
it'll tell you the teaspoons, but also the weight in grams. So it makes it very, very easy and very uh, user friendly. And this includes everything. Uh, bentonite, casein, egg white, gelatin, isinglass, pectic enzymes, PVPP. And I really like how it tells you um, what type of wine it's used for as well. So it's very nice. Here is a chart from a wine chemistry textbook I have from Davis. And it talks about finding agents, but it talks about um, what issues may arise if you add too much. So if you have, here's the winemaking problem, say excessive tannin and astringency in red wine. So the agent you'd want to use are proteins. So gelatin, albumin, isinglass, casein, and others, right? So here's the issues that come with adding an excess or adding too much. Residual protein, undesired effects on taste and color, and allergic potential. So people who have an allergy to eggs or milk or gelatin um, might have an issue with this. That's why you don't want to add this in excess. And then you know, we have other examples here too. Um, I have actually had um, a situation with this residual copper and um, as an issue in wine before. So this is very real and very um, applicable information. So, and if you want this textbook, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. I think it's just called Wine, uh, wine Chemistry. But if you would like that, just message me and I'll give you the book title and everything. Okay, if you are curious about all the wonderful things you can add to wine legally that are safe to consume, we have a fantastic website from the TTB of lists of approved additions. If it'll load here, here we go, boop, awesome. So there's a whole list of what you can add legally to wine. It'll also tell you um, the concentration that's legal. So here we go, we have um, chitosan, which can help remove spoilage organisms such as brett from wine. It's also used for clarification, finding and removing off flavors from wine and juice. This is fantastic. Um, it'll tell you um, how much you can add not to exceed 0 0.04 point pounds per one gallon. There you go, fantastic. Copper sulfate, here we go. Not to, ex not to exceed 0 0.5 parts per million. Fantastic. So it gives you a whole list. You'd be surprised what you can add to wine. Uh, fun fact about chitin, that's the component that's within uh, crustacean shells. So there's stuff there too. But then it's food for food for thought. So if, if you're curious, definitely check out that website. Okay, so this brings us into our last couple of slides where we talk about wine stability. So wine stability, there's two types of stability. There's cold stability and heat stability. So cold stability is how stable your wine can be when it's exposed to freezing temperatures for an extended amount of time. So the best scenario of this happening is you go to a party, you bring a bottle of wine, a white wine or rosé, whatever, and it's not chilled. You want to drink it, so you throw it in the freezer, but you forget about it. You pull it out of the freezer, and sometimes what happens is these crystals form. These are called wine diamonds. That's what a lot of psalms like to call it, but it's actually potassium bitartrate. Um, it's also chemically written as KHT. K is the um, symbol for potassium. It's not P. And then bitartrate is this HT. Um, it's chemically the same as cream of tartar, and it's not harmful. Um, but why do we care about this if it's not harmful? Because it's a cosmetic defect on the wine and consumers don't know this. So consumers can sometimes take this out of the freezer or they'll buy a wine and find this later and they're concerned that it's broken glass. That has been a huge concern. That's not the case. Um, it's completely harmless, but um, needless to say, wineries try to prevent this from happening. So that way consumers don't get angry and want refunds. So how do we make sure our wine is stable so this doesn't form, this doesn't happen. So what we do is we will just freeze the tank. So we expose the wine before bottling to freezing temperatures and we let the crystals form in the tank at the winery. So let all of the crystals form 
and then rack them off so that way they can't form anymore. Um, you can, you'll see a change in acid levels because what's interacting is like tartaric acid. So you can add tartaric acid to help precipitate it out. You can also plant a seed crystal so you can add some cream of tartar to the tank to help encourage it to form. Uh, this is really common in wines, especially grapes that come from high potassium rich soils. Um, there's also other additives you can add for cold stability, uh, but you have to go to that product's website and really uh, just read their instructions on what to use. There might be specific parameters that need to be met to use that, but the easiest way to do it is just freeze it. It's the most natural way. You don't have to add anything and you call it a day. So that's cold stability. On the other hand, we have heat stability. So say, again, a wine is being distributed across the United States. It's the middle of summer. It's blazing hot. Um, the cooling capacity of the transport van failed and your wine got hot and now it's all hazy and no one wants to buy it. So this is very natural. It happens all the time. Again, this is a problem that we, we're concerned about with white wines mostly because it's when the haze is most um, obvious. So to prevent this from happening, we treat our wines, this is after fermentation, with bentonite. So trials are done to determine the concentration or the rate of bentonite needed for the wine to become stable. So we'll add very small amounts, say like two grams per liter, five grams per liter, you know, 10 and up the line. Then we will put those samples in a hot box and it basically cooks the samples. It exposes them to a high temperature for an extended amount of time. Then we pull those samples out of the hot box and see if a haze is formed. So if a haze is formed at, you know, the first and second dosage rates, but not the third, we'll know that that third vial, whatever that dosage rate was, is what we want to apply to our tank, to our, to the whole product. So that way it's stable. So it passed the test is stable. So being able to determine a haze with the naked eye is one thing, but if you want to put an actual measurement to it, you use what's called a nephilometer, which we talked about before. So this is a device that's used to measure haziness, also known as turbidity of samples. And the data that is measured, the units for those are NTUs. So you just take a bit of the sample, you put it in a little tiny tube and put it in this device and it'll tell you exactly how many NTUs that is. And depending on the winery you work for and the requirements, um, it might be a requirement that white wines are below one NTU to pass for this heat stability. So it just depends where you work. Some people don't worry about it, so you just never know, but now you know. So here's a summary of today's lecture. We defined fining and in wine, what fining agents are. We talked about the different types of fining agents that are commonly used and how they operate. We talked about the severity of different fining agents. Problems that can arise from excessive use of fining agents. Just check out that table. Typical dosage rates. And we also talked a little bit about wine stability and how to cold and heat stabilize wines. If you're looking for more information on that specifically for your own use, I'd be more than happy to share some um, trial instructions with you guys. So just let me know. Alrighty. Well, that is all for today's lecture. I hope you guys learned something and I will see you next time.